Ooh, welcome back to Up in the Blue Seats podcast, our New York Rangers podcast from the New York Post. Jake Brown here with Andrew Hartz filling in for Molly Walker, who is traveling up to the north to Canada right now. And we will be joined later in the show by MSG Network's John Giannone making his first appearance on the program. But we open up here in those highlights, courtesy of MSG Network, of course, that you just heard. We open up here with Andrew Hartz, me, Jake Brown, and Larry Brooks. And lots to do here in Rangers land. A couple of games left before the all-star break, but no John Travolta or Olivia Newton, John at the garden Monday, but a lot of greasy goals, Larry, <laughs> um, you know, that was a poor attempt at a dad joke right there, but one of my favorite all time movies, you uh, know, who's, I mean, who's, who's isn't it? Yeah. I mean, are you a grease one or a grease two guy? Uh, grease no, one, a grease, a grease one. There, there is no grease two. Come on. <laughs> It's, it's Greece. You know, I mean, you know, it's not it's not Greece one. It's Greece. <laughs> yeah, of course. But there are people who are on the Greece two side. I'm with you on on the first side. Uh, a great musical as well. So uh, you get it all here and up in the blue seats. Uh, you know, a guy who may not know Greece that well is uh, Will Cooley, who was just 20 years old. Larry, uh, right. what were you doing at 20? Were, were you in college at that point? Uh, <laughs> loosely speaking, <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to go into that <laughs> yeah well listen 20 years old he's coming up and he you know yeah. he gets his chance larry here in his hometown i mean that's got to be the coolest feeling in the world to do it in front of your family and friends and get your chance at such a young age you know what do you think of cooley's uh you know debut here on wednesday i i agree and and you know the rangers you know the rangers wouldn't make this move simply because they're going to toronto but I think they looked at the schedule and said, you know what, this is a time for us to do it. And we can do this cool thing for our player. Nicely done. Um, which, you know what, and and you know what, Gallant does this religiously. When when the Rangers go on the road, if there is a player whose you know, hometown is in that city, or if there is a player who has been traded from that city or had been there for a while before leaving, he uh, invariably uh, puts him in the starting lineup. And I know it's something that's appreciated. And, uh, you know, because Gallant um, thinks thinks like a player. He, he really does. He thinks, like, he thinks the way he thought when he played for the Red Wings in the 80s, when he was uh, really one of the toughest, um, most uh, feared power wingers in the league. I mean, you know, this was an era where, you know, you fought and you scored 35 goals. I mean, you know, that, that, you know, you were expected to take care of yourself and, you know, a guy like Brendan Shanahan broke in that way. And there were just these power wingers and Gallant was one of the better of, of them. Uh, he was a really good player. I mean, I watched him, I watched him basically his entire career. He was a tough player. And, and you know that he appreciates his playing career because of the way he relates to players. And that's why sometimes, you know, listen, everyone's entitled to an opinion. And, um, but that's why sometimes I, I laugh when, when, you know, it's suggested that, you know, the, the team doesn't want to play for him. And that's, you know, that's just nonsense. Whether, whether he's making the most uh, acute decisions, it's, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's something else. But um, so that's what, that's just, you know, one point about the organization and, and the way um, the coach, goes about his business, but I think it'll be interesting. I, I, I don't know that, that Cooley is going to be here for the long haul. I, re, I really don't. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that they would even want him here for the long haul. If it's going to be in a fourth line role where he's playing eight or nine minutes a game, you know, I think, you know, there's always that balance. Is it, is it better for um, the player and at the same time, better for the organization for um, a prospect to get 18 to 22 minutes in the American League, playing on the power play, killing penalties the way Cooley has, um, or you know, do the do the Rangers really need him, and can he grow in a fourth line role where he's playing eight nine minutes? Um, so you know, I I think this is a um, a, a good opportunity for him to uh, you know uh, dip his toe in the in the NHL water, see what it's like, get a little bit of you know, get a couple of days around the team. Um, he's going on the road the first one so he'll be surrounded by his teammates of course he's been at the last couple of training camps so um it's not unfamiliar but it's different 
and then maybe he gets a, uh, you know, he'll play tomorrow and, and, you know, he, I would think uh, he'd probably play on, on Friday as well. Maybe not, but um, you know, I think, I think this is just going to be a good experience for him and, and it'll give the Rangers a, uh, you know, a firsthand look at what they have. Um, but again, I, I, I don't know that people should expect that, you know, Will Cooley is here and is going to stay. Now, maybe he'll, maybe his play will, will dictate that. And, and I, and I suppose it will, but again, I don't think you want a 20 year old playing eight minutes a night. I could see it now. Will Cooley gets the game winning goal back page <laughs> of the New York post. Cool runnings. I'm just saying <laughs> it's as simple as that. It's it's I'll, I'll take all credit for it right there. Okay. Um, look, I mean, I, I, I'm very excited. I think uh, Cooley will bring a nice spark of, um, you know, youth, to the lineups and whatnot that um, that Gerard Gallant has been changing around quite frequently, but we'll get into that later. Um, but obviously the move is because of Sammy Blay, and you wrote about it in the post and whatnot, and how we're now roughly 14 months since that hit he took right. from PK Subban. And look, he just, he's not been the same guy. And you kind of wonder at this point, I mean, is, is, is it a mental thing for him? You know, do, do we ever see him bounce back to where he is? Cause he's an unrestricted uh, free agent after this right. now. So, um, you know, right. is, is there a future for Sammy Blay with the Rangers or even in the NHL at this point? Well, I don't think, you know, honestly, I don't think there's, there's a future with the Rangers, but I don't think there would have been a future with the Rangers uh, beyond this year, even if Sammy Blay had come back to being the player he was before the injury, he would have priced himself out. You know, the, the Rangers just aren't going to have space to accommodate a $2 million, $2.5 million fourth line player. It, it, they're just not. They, you know, they're, you know, there's going to be some pain ahead. We've talked about this a lot. It's been a recurring theme because it doesn't change. You know, this is this is the situation. So I, you know, whether whether Blay can um somehow find it in himself to you know to rehabilitate himself in the next couple of weeks uh he's going to play in hartford he's got six games down there in the next couple of weeks um he'll he'll play minutes you know and and you know again he's a, he's another player on the fourth line and the guy trying to come back from injury trying to um trying to reestablish himself it's hard playing eight and nine minutes you know you get out there you have a shift um, either you have a real good energetic shift or it's, it's, you know, it's a blah shift, but then you might have to wait seven minutes to get back on the ice. If there are a couple of power plays, you know, either way, you're going to be skipped. The fourth line is going to be skipped. He doesn't kill penalties, you know? So, it, you know, that, that compounds, um, the difficulty for, for Sammy Blay. I, I, I think you raise a, a good point. I'm, I'm sure part of it is mental. Um, you know, neither one of us is, is, is a doctor. So, you know, neither one of us is is you know <laughs> you know has has, has the uh, insight to you know to make a, a diagnosis but i'm sure I, I you know i'm sure there is this is uh, you know he was he, you know his career was ascending um he'd been traded to the new york rangers who wanted him it, you know he wasn't a throwaway the, the rangers wanted him and his first month as a ranger he was playing in the top nine every game he, he didn't play on the fourth line last year so and and you know he was he had played a bit with Heedle and Lafreniere that was a nice looking line, and then they moved him up to the to the first line. They moved him up with Zabanajad and Kreider, which is where he was when he got hurt. And you know it's you you see this and and you just see a career, um, you know that is at least currently in ruins. Um, and you know if it you know if it. Um, if he doesn't, if if he can't um, break in as a regular again in the NHL, if he doesn't make a contribution, it's going to be a tough summer for him as a free agent. We know how hard it is with the with the flat cap. Um, it's going it's going to be difficult. So, you know, I think everybody's rooting for Sammy Blay. He's you know he's a hardworking young man. He was he was very personable. Uh, you know, last year when he when he came here first, he's he's been. Um, you know, he's been as personable as possible going through this you know, difficult stretch, um, you know, this year too. So I think everybody wants to see Sammy Blay, you know, um, be f well enough physically and mentally that he can, you know, psychologically that he can come back and, and be a player. But, um, you know, it's, it's um, the burden of proof is on him at this point. And, and you know what? The Rangers would love to see it because, no matter how many 
skilled, fast, talented guys they they put on the fourth line, which is what they're doing at this point. Um, you know, pro- out of necessity, really, because that's what they have. Um, they they would love to see a guy like Blay, you know, bring a physical element to that fourth line, which you know, gen- you know, traditional fourth lines are physical. You know, they're they're energy lines. They you know they they're momentum changers by by you know heavy forechecking and creating you know chaos for forty seconds, and that's you know what Blay is is good at, and so. They don't. They don't have another player like that. Like, like as, you know, as when I was writing about Blay, remember last year in July when Jury took over, they brought in these guys. You know, they brought in Blay. They 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 brought in Reeves. They brought in Dryden Hunt. Um, you know, they, even, even even you know Patrick Nemeth. Um, uh, you know, was a, a bigger guy, and and of course Goodrow. And you know, they're you know. You know, Blay now is in Hartford on on conditioning, and so Goodrow's the only guy left. You know, I mean, you know, so so they they need to replenish the group they you know they brought in last year because we know in the playoffs, it it you know it, it there's you know we know in the playoffs it's it's there's not nearly the you know the the balance towards skill that there is during the regular season. So much more is is allowed to go on. You've got to be big. You you know you've got to get to the net. Um, you got to win your battles. So, uh, you know, I, and, and as I've said a couple of times, I think, you know, at the deadline, could they use a top six right wing? We've been talking about that for, you know, mm-hmm. yep. 15, 16 months. But I also think they need to, I think they need to get bigger and, and, and just tougher, not that they're soft, but just, you know, players who are more suited to the grind that the, the playoffs become. So, you know, if Sammy Blake can, can make his way back, He'll be he'll be welcome with open arms. That's for sure. Another player that might have to make his way back that the Rangers want more from is Vitaly Krasov, who now becomes likely a healthy scratch. What does this mean for him? I mean, I know you said Cooley. We don't know if this will be long term. It could just be a few games. But what does this move here mean for Krasov? Well, listen, if Krasov's not going to play in the top nine, you know, the fourth line doesn't give him much of an opportunity, you know, to showcase his skills. Again, you know, you're 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 talking about eight minutes, maybe eight and a half minutes. So, um, um, you know, it, it, it's not really conducive to success for Kravtsov. I mean, he and Gallant has acknowledged that. You know, he's not really a fourth line player. So, you know, I think, um, you know, Kravtsov's going to have to wait for a chance in the top nine if 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 that comes about. Um, we know how many moves there are here. Uh, we know how many you know line changes there are. Um, game in Toronto is going to be a tough one. Um, the game in Vegas is going to be a challenge. So um, you know, I I wouldn't I wouldn't think that this lineup is is etched in stone at this point. So you know, he just needs to to keep working. I don't I don't think there are any larger issues except for the fact that. Barkley Goodrow has played his way into the top nine. There's there's no question about it. You know. Uh, He's he's you know he's been one of their best and most consistent players all year, and he needs more ice time. He needs top nine ice time, and Jimmy Vc's played his way into the top nine. He needs you know top nine ice time. If if you know Kravtsov were outplaying one of those two, then maybe it would change. So, but again, you know it's um, you know they're two games by week, and you know we'll see where they are when they come back. Now, a big topic of discussion last week, Larry, was their matchup with the Boston Bruins. Obviously, it didn't go well. I mean, you know, you lose a game. We kind of expected it to be a tough one. I'm just curious. We kind of view that one as a, um, you know, a measuring stick, almost like yeah. just because, I mean, obviously yeah. the Bruins are just on this, this torrid path right now. Um, what do you think of it? What what how, how do you how do you think the Rangers stacked up in that game against, you know, obviously the best team in the NHL currently? Um. I I, uh, I thought it was um, an okay effort. Um, I didn't, you know, what 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 the Bruins do so well is they play every shift. You know, they have their talent. There's no question. You know, they have some special players, but they play every shift. They compete on every shift, and they push the pace early. Then when they need, they think they need to lock it down. They're able to lock it down, and I and I thought that the Rangers didn't match that shift by shift commitment 
didn't you know didn't didn't match Boston's commitment to detail. I mean, you know, the Bruins were detail oriented every shift. The Rangers had their had their moments where they got careless, and I and I thought really to me that was that was the biggest difference in the game. I, I don't think the Rangers um, top players particularly had had you know had outstanding games as i recall was last week at this point um but that, I, you know I, I don't recall any i don't recall anyone really standing out um is that a coaching and, thing though or is that that just just the talent wise like the players not yeah, i think they're not yeah I, th- I think they're probably not where boston is at this point um i get you know I, I think it was a little disappointing to them that, that they weren't better um i know galant thought that they they um uh, the Trocek Panarin line just gave up way too much. I, I didn't really, I, I thought it was interesting the way um, he responded to that game. Cause I, I didn't, you know, me, um, I didn't really see that as, as the problem. He thought they were just giving up way too much. And I actually thought they gave up way more against Florida last night, you know, when he, you know, he put these new lines together to play, you know, so, so they could lock down a little bit and, um, you know, it, it was it was a, a strange one last night against the Panthers because I didn't think the Rangers played that well. And I don't think the coach did either. And yet, you know, they win the game six to two. Um, you know, Florida's goaltending wasn't very good and 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 the Rangers goaltending was exceptional. But, um, you know, I, I, I didn't, I, you know, against Boston, a team that is on, you know, a, a haste to have the best record in the league in, in you know, 95 years. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I didn't get the sense that the Rangers were overmatched in any way. I just, I just think that in order to play in order to, and they can play with Boston, but in order to beat Boston, it's going to need to be shift by shift by shift by shift the way, you know, really what it took to beat and, and ultimately weren't able to do the way they needed to be able to, to you know, to play against Tampa, to beat them, you know, they, they could play with Tampa. But it was just, you know, one shift after another, after another, after another. And again, I I, th- I think the Bruins, you know, won um, more, of the, more of the 50-50s. I think they, they won more of the battles. And, and that's where, um, you know, the Rangers, I think, are going to have to look at their personnel and and try and bulk up a little bit for the playoffs. But I've, you know, I, I thought that going into the season, um, and I think that now watching that, you know, they – they need to be a stiffer team against there. You're not getting pushed around. They're not soft, but they need to be stiffer and, and still harder to play against, I think. And, you know, and, and that's um, uh, and sometimes that's exposed a little bit when you play a team as, as good as Boston. Now, there's only one team in the league as good as Boston right now. Right. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see them play Toronto. Um, they played really well against Toronto at, at the Garden. A while ago, um, Toronto's a different kind of team. They're, you know, a speed, you know, a speed talent team. Um, the Rangers are going to have to be careful with their talent, but um, you know that'll that'll be an interesting one too. I and, and I think where we are with the Rangers is that these are the comparisons that need to be made. It's it's not well, you know, they're in the playoffs. It's great. It's not yeah, well, they're in the playoffs. That's the the minimum requirement at this point this season. Um, so it's how do you stack up and and how are you going to repair or or narrow the divide against any of the top teams in the league because they're here to win. They're not here just to, you know, finish an eighth or um, you know, win one round. I mean, that may be ha- that may happen. I mean, you know, it's, um doesn't and that wouldn't wouldn't necessarily mean this season's a failure, depending on how it goes. But um, you know, these are the teams the Rangers need to be um, evaluating themselves against the Maple Leafs, Bruins, teams like that. Well, two, two games left here before the All-Star break. Larry, are you making the trip to Florida for All-Star weekend? No, young Sears is going to be making that trip. Oh. Uh, young Ethan Sears is, is, has been, been chosen by acclamation uh, to be the post <laughs> representative. <laughs> I, I assume Molly is going too. I, I uh, uh, Miss Walker, Miss Walker will be uh, 
uh, enjoying the uh, break in New York. Oh, okay. So Young Sears will hold Young, it down. Young Sears is, is, you know, the Young Sears is the post representative. That is, that's a nice rap name for him as well. Young Sears on the ones <laughs> and twos Sears. down in uh, Sunrise, Florida. Well, well, you know what? Obviously, it's Young Walker and even younger Sears. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He is. Yeah. That is very, very young. He's like 22, 23, fresh out of school. So shout out to Young Sears. Does it, great, it, does it you know, he does a great job. He really yeah. does. He does a terrific job. He does. He does it all. Islanders, Rangers, all star. He does it all. And so does Larry Brooks, who you can follow on yeah. Twitter at MYP underscore Brooksy. Larry, we'll talk to you next week. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right, we're back on Up in the Blue Seats. Jake Brown, Andrew Hartz with our special guest. Joining us for the first time in the history of the program, we're glad to have him on. You see him on MSG Network, studio host, anchor, between the benches reporter. We welcome in a former New York Post employee. That would be John Gianone from MSG Network in the building. You can follow him on Twitter at JGMSG. John, welcome to the program. How are you? Jake, Andrew, thanks a lot. I would assume at this moment, I feel like my career has come full circle. 1988, I started at the Post, and now tonight in 2023, here I am talking to you guys 35 years later. So it actually is a pleasure to be with you guys. I appreciate it. Well, listen, when you left the Post, the Rangers ended up winning the Cup. So now that you're back on a Post platform, I think the transitive property states that the Rangers will win the Cup in 2023. Oh, that's where you're going with that. I was wondering how that was going to all fit in. Yeah, the first the first time uh, I was at the Post for six years, I covered a variety of beats. And then I moved over to the Daily News in the spring of 94. And my assignment was, yeah, just cover the Rangers as far as they go in the Stanley Cup, we'll move Frank Brown to from the Rangers beat to the column job. Well, there you go. Three months later, the Rangers were driving down the Canyon of Heroes. So that was pretty special. Uh, pretty special couple months that I remember very well. So you were working with who were still there, Mike Vaccaro and Steve Servi back then, right? So, yeah, well, Steve was definitely at the Post when I was still there. I mean, Steve was at the Post since the 70s, so he he predates me at the Post by at least a dozen years or more. Um, I think Mike Vaccaro had come in just after I left. If I'm not mistaken, he just celebrated either his 20th or 25th anniversary at the Post. So he came in a little bit after me, but, yeah, at the time, oh, gosh. Uh, I think Paul Schwartz came right after you left, too. Right, so I was covering the Giants for the New York Post in 93. And then when I left to go to the Daily News in the spring of 94, Paul was named the Giants beat writer. So technically, Paul replaced me, which is pretty crazy that he's still there. Um, and in fact, when I was there, I helped get Mark Canizaro hired as the Jets beat writer. And I know Mark is still there. So uh, I just recently had uh, a reunion lunch with about seven or eight guys who I worked with at the post. Dave Blezzo was there, who's still one of you guys, uh, a major player in the sports department. So for me, it was just unbelievable to reminisce about stories from 35 years ago. Well, your coworkers now are obviously pretty big names that, you know, a lot of major fans know Henrik Lundqvist, Steve Alicat. Uh What's it like working with those guys? I mean, obviously they both bring a lot of personality to the broadcast. Hank's been doing a great job, I feel like, but I mean, in terms of flash, you know, that, have, have you felt the need to kind of step up your suit game a little bit every now and then, or, you know, without you know, doubt, <laughs> Steve and I both said it as a matter of fact, last night, because Steve had a pretty cool suit on and I, I made note of that. And he said the same to me. It was like, he said, we were really left with no choice, but to do that. I'd say over the summer, I went out and bought about six or seven new suits because look, there's no competing with the guy. It's just patently unfair what he brings to the world and just literally just look at him and then listen to him and then see what he accomplished on the ice and then see what he does in every other walk of life. I, I mean, I always tease him. I said he was assaulted by the lucky stick um, and he knows it too, which is what makes it great. You know, I covered the guy for 15 years. I probably interviewed him 1,200 times. And I never quite got to know in those 15 years, the Henrik that I've gotten to know really within the first month that he was with us in the studio, but certainly over this last almost two years together. He's got a phenomenal personality. He loves to laugh. He loves to have a good time. He says the best part of doing the show with us is what happens off the air because we really do laugh and kid around and keep him loose the entire time that we're there. 
And I think on the air, they are the perfect complement because Steve is very analytical. He loves the statistical end and how it applies to every game situation. Whereas Hank just likes to delve into what is that player thinking at that moment? Why did that happen in terms of whether a goal was scored or a goal was not scored? So I think it works perfectly together. And of the seven or eight backups that Hank had during his career, you can tell that the one that he was closest to and the one that he formed a kinship with the most was Steve. And it's really my hope and my job to just kind of get them to that point on the air and then just stand back and let them sort of show that to the fans. And so far the reception has been pretty good. So I'm happy about that. The one time I interviewed Henrik, I thought I was looking cool. I had a blue blazer on. I thought I was looking pretty fresh and then he's got on like the coolest blazer ever. And he's so good looking. Do you ever just look at him and think he's this man is so goddamn handsome. Like how do I compare to this? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if I use that word, but I do shake my head every once in a while. I always hearken back to about six years ago. I was waiting for him after a morning skate and I had to do an interview for him for that night's show. And I said to him, hey, Hank, you got a minute? And he had just he had probably been off the ice about five minutes. He was still in his leg pads, but, you know, his, his, he, he put on a sweat top kind of like this. And he, he, he didn't have a hat nearby. So he just said, just give me give me a minute or so. I was like, all right, no problem. He literally went like this. Right. And now, now it's perfect. It looks like, like he's Baywatch. Right. So I just looked at him and I said, and I won't repeat what I said, but I just said on behalf of every other dude in the world. Mm-mm. And he laughed. And that's probably as, as much of a, of a chuckle as I got out of him in the 15 years, you know, like I said, we passed each other every day on the plane or at the hotel or certainly in morning skates and practices. But Hank was always very reserved. Like he had his way of doing things, whether it was a practice or a game, everything was super serious. He knew my role. I knew his role. We had a really good relationship where that was concerned, but I love that we've gone beyond that. And I've gotten to know him and his family and, and, and just what he brings as a person. And uh, in trying to get that out in the broadcast, I, it's it's really enjoyable. It really is. I mean, he, I've worked with a ton of people over 35 years in the business, and he is as uh, entertaining and enjoyable to work with as anybody. You've seen the Ranger team, obviously, at the highest of highs, 94. You're right there. You're obviously super close to the team now. What's the overall feeling that you get from the current club in terms of, you know, trying to compete, at least make a good run for a playoff spot here? I, I, I think as of right now, they're, they're in line to make the playoffs, but obviously coming off of the hype last year, going deep into um, a cup run last year, um, there was a lot of hype um, trying to get them back there this year. Do you get the same feeling about that? Um, you know, obviously moves have to be made. You know, what's your overall reaction currently? I think the last thing you said, Andrew, is what really stands out to me is I think they understand that moves have to be made. I think it's a season after nearly 50 games that's still a work in progress in terms of ultimately establishing and determining what they are and who they are. I think Gerard Glant has a very definite idea of the way he wants them to play, to try to both play to their greatest strengths, but also be the kind of team that can succeed when they need to the most, which is April, May, and June. And it is, in that regard, very much a work in progress, probably more upfront than defensively. I think they're genuinely satisfied with what they have on the blue line. I think they're comfortable, especially with what Ben Harper has brought, to just sort of solidify and calm down that left D position on the third pair. Braden Schneider has been as advertised. He's been terrific, and he's going to get even better. Uh, Truba, as Larry Brooks wrote not too long ago, maybe last week, is starting to show signs of coming out of what was a real rough first half, physically, maybe emotionally being captain, getting off to a bad start, and then trying to do too much to get out of it too quickly. Uh, Fox and Lindgren are who they are. They're a top pair D. And of course, Shesterkin, who I still think they believe has that next gear as he showed last year. He's maybe a half notch below where he was last year, which is probably why the Rangers are a half notch below where they were last year. So if you really brought it down to that, I think over these next couple months until the March trade deadline, I think what they're really going to focus on is Who are the players who most can play the way Gerard Gallant believes this team needs to play, which is more straight line and more focused on not giving up pucks in the neutral zone. Like the the game against Florida on Monday night, 
to me, I thought it was a pretty decent game. Second period was a little spotty. Third period was terrific. Bust out with those two early goals and put the game away. First period was good. They had a lead after one. Gerard Gallant was not satisfied with much of the way that night went. And I think it's because of the amount of pucks given away in the neutral zone. And he believes that's where the weakness of this team is. So I think between now and when the playoffs come, the focus is going to be on fortifying what happens in the middle of the ice with all four lines. Will Cooley is going to make his debut Wednesday. He'll get to play at least Wednesday or Friday. Cool guy. I know the name, you know, the alliterations, the titles. Yeah. I mean, just a guy, he looks cool. Like, I want to have a beer with him. He's got the hair, the spiked uh, up hair like I had back in college at 20 years old when I did have hair. Uh, what are you looking yeah. forward to seeing from Cooley? And do you think this kid could uh, stick here for past, you know, just a couple of weeks? I know they get the All-Star break coming up. Yeah, you know, I always hesitate to say what somebody can and can't do when they come up that quickly. I think what you want to show right off the bat is that you're not overawed by the experience. Now, you know, in Toronto on national television, good luck. Uh, how are you not going to be in your NHL debut? He had a really impressive training camp, and I think the Rangers gave him a little more of an extra look than they probably would have otherwise. He's acquitted himself well virtually everywhere he's been. A little bit of a slow start in Hartford, but the team itself uh, has been inconsistent through the first half of the AHL season. I don't know how much he's going to play. Again, I think Gerard Gallant is still more about on that specific night, we need these points. I don't think he believes yet that it's an ironclad guarantee that they're in. So until that point, developing a young player, seeing if he could strike lightning in a bottle, seeing who he would best play with, that's all going to take a backseat to what's going on during those 60 minutes. So I'll reserve judgment on what Will Cooley can do, but I do know the organization is very high on what his potential could be over the next year or two. Obviously bringing in a guy like him will, you know, you, you hope at least kind of jolts them, gives them a little bit of energy, especially on the fourth line and whatnot. But like you mentioned before, March 1st is coming soon and the Rangers do have to make some moves here. So obviously the name that gets brought up almost weekly on this podcast is Patrick Kane. Take uh, a shot. Take a shot. We brought up Patrick every Kane. time. Yeah, yeah. Dollar dollar in the jar. Uh, but with that said, though, I mean, besides Kaner, like, it, 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 who else do you see on the Rangers radar potentially um, as, as someone that they can bring in that can move the needle that can help them make that push? Yeah, it's, that's a good question because there are a couple of guys out there who have expiring contracts. And I think a lot of people are starting to look to those types. Patrick Kane is obviously the one that's on the Rangers radar and Ranger fans have wanted him because of what he did for Panera. Now, remember that was three teams ago and six years ago, but there's no question that what Artemi Panera needs more than anything else. And he proved it on Monday against the uh, Florida Panthers when he was put on that top line is somebody to pass to who can actually score. And Artemi Panarin's confidence level and his, uh, his enthusiasm for the game, which is infectious and almost always apparent, does wane at times during the course of a game. And I see it between the benches when things aren't going the way he wants them to. And usually that's dictated by did his play result in either a scoring opportunity or a goal. That hasn't been happening very much. So obviously the, you know, one plus one equals two. Patrick Kane has done that in the past for Panera and Patrick Kane can still do it. But what kind of a King's ransom are the Rangers willing to pay to get a guy like that? So I don't know. I, and I think for the, for the, for the A level available guys, right. You know, like the guy in Vancouver who everybody's talking about Bo Horvat or a guy in Timo Meyer in San Jose, those guys with expiring contracts who have, you know, the back of their hockey card proves who they are. Those guys are going to demand so much. And I just don't know how willing Chris Drury is going to be to give up as much as he has. And there's not a ton of it uh, to, to give, you know, do you want to give up an established young NHL forward? That might mean Kako. That might mean Heedle. That might mean Lafreniere. Although he is established in the NHL, he hasn't established himself at all as a number one overall pick. Do you want to give up Brendan Offman, who is supposed to be your blue chip offensive uh, prospect? Do you want to give up Braden Schneider? Uh, if the answer to any of those questions is no, then you can't go out and get one of those top tier players. So then it becomes like last year. Vetrano and Cobb and Mott before he got injured, those players made a difference in what the Rangers did in the playoffs. 
I believe that's who Chris Drury is going to be looking for down the stretch is players like that who can either play top six minutes because they're uh, proven top six players or can move down the lineup as you continue on in the playoffs and players either are playing well or aren't. But I do believe it's going to be a difficult road to hoe this year, much different than it was last year. I think when the Rangers had a little bit more to give. You're a six time Emmy award winner. I was hoping to see some of them behind you in the background. There, there's right some, there. there's, there's some, a, there's a bookshelf uh, over here that has a couple other. I get yeah, they're, they're I, as dusty as you can get there. I haven't won one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see, in the I back see one in that corner. Yeah, yeah. Well, they always make a strategic appearance at some point. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like, where's Waldo? I'm looking for it. It's like, it's exactly. there it is in that corner. Yeah. Uh, you've been at MSG longer than Will Cooley's been alive. Isn't that kind of crazy? 21 uh, years yeah. now. Sorry to make you feel old. Up in the air. I think it all the time. Yeah. That's just at MSG. You know, like I said before, it, it, it astonishes me when I look at a calcul- at a calendar and I see 1988 was 35 years ago. Like there's one ranger on the team who's who was alive when I started in the business. And actually I worked at CBS Sports for three years before I got to the post. So my career in sports media has is going on 40 years because I graduated Fordham back in 85. So yeah, I don't like to think about that because it makes me feel like the end is nearer than the beginning was which is not a great thing <laughs> but think about it. i mean after bouncing around at different places to be at one spot 20 years and have the success you had and to do it at the garden i mean i know the office is right across the street from the garden it's a perfect location you get to be in the studio sometimes you're in the arena you've seen all the magic over the, these last 20 i guess there hasn't been a ton of magic considering there hasn't been a knicks title or a rangers title but there have been magical moments there's been a finals appearance the rain uh, knicks have made the playoffs a few times uh, it's been a hell of a ride, right? All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to dip into the hokey meter meter here. Uh, the first time I ever went in the garden was 1975. I was 12 years old. My dad got me tickets for Christmas to go to a Rangers Buffalo Sabres game. I had seen games, a uh, few of them on TV because back in the day there was no cable and home games were not on TV because that was an enticement to get the fans to go to home games. So I had seen it once or twice when it was on national TV, but I, the first time I went to the garden, I could not conceive of the, of the idea that the rink was on the fifth floor. Like what is below it, you know? And then I, what, 30 years later, I came to find out my office was below it because my office, when I started at MSG was on the fourth floor and we'd be in the office preparing for that night's show, which at the, when I started at MSG in 2002, I did sports desk, which was like a sports center type show for only New York sports. And when we were in there and there was a concert, our ceiling would shake. It would just rock because we were one floor below where they have all the events. Uh, I will not lie to you, speaking of hokey, every single time I go in that building, I think about that night when I was 12 years old. And I say, I can't believe that a kid who grew up in Flushing, who decided at, you know, who, who was the stereotypical radio under the pillow, listening to Marv Albert call games when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, who decided at 15 that I wanted to be on radio or TV, went to Fordham to try to do that, was in the newspaper business for the first 10 years, and then got lucky enough to, you know, get a job at CNN on, on the air doing sports and then transfer to MSG. It's still astounding to me at almost 60 that that's what I get to do for a living. And then to stand between the benches and experience the best hockey players, therefore athletes on earth, do what they do from two inches in front of me is something that will never get old. I'm not lying. It's funny because I remember going to the garden when I was like eight years old to see a WWF event. And I had a very similar conversation with my dad when we had to go up to, you know, the sixth or seventh floor, wherever the main floor was. And I remember saying, you know, why are we going up if if the ring is on the first floor? He goes, no, 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 no. It, it's actually above the, you know, the first few floors. And I couldn't get, I was like, that makes no sense. And then once he told me that, that there was actually ice underneath where the wrestling ring was, I was like, what, how is there ice? Yeah. And people are standing. It, it, it blew my mind, but right. no, that's, yeah. that's the magic of the garden. And uh, no, it's, it's, it's a special place. Every time I get to go in there or whatnot, you know, you always think of just all the, the magical memories that, that have happened there between music and sports and whatnot. Um, before we let you go, I got one more for you. And you actually kind of mentioned it a little bit. You are between the benches, and I'm sure you've heard some crazy things. What is the best thing that you can repeat that you've heard that you can repeat on this podcast? Uh, 
I did love the time and I wish I could. I think it was Zach Stortini. Zach Stortini was a goon for the Flyers and, and he was getting, it was a preseason game and he was getting on the Rangers bench because his way of making the team was going to be to start a fight. So he was trying to pick on different players to try to entice them into having a fight. And Brad Richards just leaned over and said, enjoy fantasy camp. <laughs> I thought that was, like I, the, their F-bombs fly all the time. Last night I heard 20 of them. Uh, and, you know, uh, at one point, I think Matthew Kachuk was accusing Ryan Lindgren of diving. So there was a lot, there were a few F-bombs exploded there. I think at one point, Ben Harper was trying to get Ryan Lomberg off his back. And he was, ba Lomberg was basically saying, I'll meet you out there. We'll fight. Now Lomberg's 5'9 and Harper's 6'6. So there was some short jokes thrown back and forth. But I do love when the cleverness comes in. I really do. Like, I mean, there, there were, there was one and I won't even name who they were but it was really crude because it involved the player's sister and it was like it it got that intense and that one was like oh boy I think even a couple of rangers were like you didn't just say that uh so you hear that kind of stuff once in a while but by and large when it gets clever like enjoy fantasy camp or something like that that's always where I just I'll just chuckle you've done it all kind of been a utility guy like super john McEwing uh over here doing <laughs> doing it all what do you prefer the most do you like in between the benches do you like filling in for Sam and play-by-play, -play, radio play-by-play? -play? Do you like studio? What do you like best? To be honest with you, because my background is, is writing and journalism uh, and covered beats virtually in every sport, the idea of being able to tell somebody something that nobody else could know because they wouldn't have the ability, that's what I enjoy doing. So the Between the Benches gig, again, because you're experiencing what they're able to do on an eighth of an inch blade on ice, as well as they do it in and of itself is amazing to me. But to be able to then say, for example, if a guy is doubled over at the bench and you don't know why, but you come to find out that his skate lace got sliced on the last shift. So now they're trying to frantically put that lace back on. Being able to tell the viewers what's happening if the referees are are, are talking and having a summit or a player and a ref like the other night when we were featuring Mika Zibanejad and he was constantly talking to the linesman. I was able to give some insight as to why he does that because no two linesmen drop the puck the same way. And as a face-off guy, he needs to know what the nuances are of each lineman so that maybe it gives him a small advantage. So being able to kind of provide that little window, that little peek of what I can see and hear that nobody else can, I think I get more enjoyment out of that than anything else but but being able to work in the studio especially with Hank and Steve is is a singular thrill that I thought I would never be able to uh, to achieve because I didn't necessarily have formal training or previous experience in hosting it's just something that sort of has developed over the years of live television and speaking extemporaneously a hundred percent of the time without a teleprompter ever and being between the benches, like, that's as close to being a player as you can be. Like you didn't get to play the game, but you're right, right there with these guys. And that's got to be, I mean, it's better than the, you know, I, I cover some of the games. I mean, you're on the roof. I mean, the chase yeah. bridge is a solid view, but you're up there. Like you got to bring the Kleenex. Your nose might start bleeding a little bit. Being down well, there has got to be awesome. My nose bled one time down there too, if you remember. Uh, 10 years ago next month when I didn't get out of the way in time of a Mark Stahl clearing pass and it mm -hmm. caught me right smack. Um, and the other night, actually, I, this was no joke. Uh, when I was down there, there was a it was against the Bruins and there was a pass that was made from Marshand who was right in front of the penalty boxes. And he made a cross ice pass to Smith, Craig Smith, and his stick blade should have been like this and it was like this. And the puck ramped and it would just, and it was coming hard and it went straight up and I went like this and I looked up and it was probably that far away from where my head was. Is there and a lot of that? Like, are you ducking and diving all over the place? Every I'd night? say once a game, it's either a stick, a, a body check or a puck where I actually, if I'm not paying attention, good luck. So, you know, and, but while I'm in there, I'm also, you know, I'm also talking to my producer and my director, telling them things that maybe they didn't catch on first glance that they want to look for in a replay or, hey, so-and-so is injured behind the play, keep an eye on that. Uh, plus, knowing that I'm going in the studio to do a between periods uh, analysis segment, then going across the street to do the post-game show, I have to keep notes during the game. 
So there are quite a few times where I'm writing stuff down while the play is going on. And if you see the play fly through the neutral zone and the camera swings by, you may see me with my head completely down, which is not a smart thing to do in there, but it's something that unfortunately at times I have to do. So I really do have to stay on my toes the whole time. It's been 10 years since I got plunked. And the other night that would have, if it hit me, that would have sent me probably to the hospital because that thing was probably going three times as fast as the one that actually hit me. We're going to need to get you some protective gear down there. Some well, goggles. The thing is, I won't wear a helmet because it might hit me in the face and I won't wear a cage because that would just look silly. So it's just, it's an occupational hazard. That's sure. yeah. I need some goggles, maybe a cup. I don't know. <laughs> one, of, one of the two. Well, you could see him on MSG network. He's a six time Emmy award winner. Does a great job on the Rangers broadcast, John Giannone and a former New York post employee. Great to finally have you on up in the blue seats. And uh, hopefully we'll talk to you later in the season. And a proud one, gents. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the year. All righty. Thanks to John Giannone for joining the program and Larry Brooks, as usual, that'll wrap up episode 111 of up in the blue seats, our Rangers podcast from the New York post. Thanks to Andrew Hartz for co-hosting and helping me produce this show where you can catch up on it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, Amazon, wherever you get podcasts. And subscribe to the New York Post Sports YouTube page to watch full episodes of the show. If you're watching this, give us a thumbs up and comment as well. You can follow us on Twitter at Jake Brown Radio and at Andrew Hartz. Hartz, my birthday is coming up next weekend. The big three, two. And, you know, it is just such an ordeal trying to, like, plan something. Like, I, it, I was reminded because I got a Facebook notification from someone who is planning their birthday celebration for like March 12th. And I'm like, March 12th? I don't know what I'll be doing. I can't even figure out a week in advance. People are doing six weeks in advance just to like get a dinner. Like it is just a big ordeal. And then I'm like brainstorming how I'm going to send the text where it doesn't look robotic to whoever I send it. Hey, exclamation point. It's like, it's like you, you're like, Jake, you just texted me five minutes ago, but I mean, you got to copy and paste. You think I'm going to go through the work of saying an individual text to each one. So everything just around planning for the birthday is kind of stressful. And usually I just do a nice Benny Hanna dinner with like a couple of people, but making it a big ordeal and inviting everyone and who to invite and can they bring someone it's just kind of frustrating planning it out. I mean, honestly, that's why I'm very, very big when it comes to birthday celebrations, if you will. You go sporting event. If there's a game happening on your birthday, you know, I, I'm, I'm obviously a Yankee fan, but if there's a Met game happening like last year, you met up with me at, at the Mets game. It was fireworks night. It's easy that way. At least you kind of know what's going on. That that way you can give the far, you know, a far enough advance. But when you have to do like a reservation or a dinner and you're trying to find out who's around or whatnot and what restaurant... No, not worth it. But well, I don't have the baseball game. I have the Knicks play on my birthday. But t- tickets have been a fortune. It's like, I mean, my mom might get me. I'm going to go to Knicks Heat probably. Your president, she's going to get me Knicks Heat tickets for Thursday the second. Um, but you know, a game is tough because the garden's so expensive. So I just got to do a dinner and figure out where to go out. But like, you know, there's just people who are going to get the axe and not get the invite, or you know, people that will get the invite who you'll end up regretting that you invited them later on because there'll be drama or like. They'll bring someone and they'll cause drama. So it is just very stressful trying to figure this out. So I'll probably do a dinner and drinks Saturday night and then do either Benny Hot or Liberidin, who we went to. One of the, my new favorite restaurants in New York City, French restaurant, uh, went again last week. Shout out to Mike there. It is just a tremendous place. If you haven't gone, it becomes a party, too, after 9, 10 p.m. The Mamma Mia soundtrack comes on and, and all hell breaks loose in a good way at LeBaron. Well, I'm looking forward to the birthday, but not really as much as you get older, just because it just becomes a little bit of a deal. For Andrew Hartz, Larry Brooks, John Giannone, I'm Jake Brown. We'll be back earlier next week as the All-Star break is ahead of us. Molly will be back. We'll preview All-Star Week, kind of give a synopsis of the first half of the Rangers season and uh, look ahead to the Rangers in the All-Star game down in Florida. So we'll be back likely on Tuesday with a new episode next week. Thanks everybody for listening to Up in the Blue Seats. Stay safe, everybody.